So before we start, uh, one comment. So yesterday, those of you who were on Serious Games course, uh, there was a short discussion about autonomous cars. And uh, there are some new developments. So for example, the uh, aviation industry kind of went through because historically they couldn't do the same thing. So in case of emergency, the pilot was taking over the control over the electronics and then the pilot was responsible. But they argued that the electronics is actually more reliable and better in terms of emergency that now it's the other way around. So in terms of something really bad happening, the computer takes over and the computer lands the plane, not, not the pilot. And they kind of went through the legislation that that's the, the norm now. And the car industry is sort of trying to do the same, saying that, you know, taking the control over the vehicle where there is an emergency is actually safer to everybody than letting the driver do the mistakes and do the uh, bad decisions. So if they go through the legislation process, then it will be easier for autonomous cars to be actually driven. And the plans are that by 2017, they should have all the things sort of sorted. And in some of the states in US, they will have the legislation allowing fully autonomous cars to, to, to do that. And it's sort of simpler um, because if the legislation goes through, that, that will be the norm. So for example, the Google autonomous cars, they actually don't have a steering wheel at all. It's like it's fully autonomous. Uh, the driver can't take control over the car. It's sort of the software which drives the, the cars all the, all the way. Um, yeah, so that, that was just a comment uh, for the yesterday's lecture. Uh, some of the topics which we cover uh, are very overlapping the serious games. So there are at least two or three papers from the list which we have for the augmented reality which heavily overlap with the uh, serious games course because they use games uh, as the main sort of uh, um, application domain. Um, and I quite like the paper about um, learning Spanish language uh, in, the, in the context. It's a very specific kind of a niche project, but it, I, I ask Simon, you know, does it belong to this course on, or to the serious games? Because it's sort of almost kind of overlapping perfectly both of the of the topics but yeah I mean most of you are doing both courses anyway so it doesn't really matter which uh, which one is which and one final announcement so we will be talking about augmented reality and various types of augmentations and various types of um, presenting the real world to the user so we historically were doing quite a lot of work with camera feeds so you have the camera feeding the video stream of real world into your eyes through some sort of a, either mobile screen or some head mounted uh, display and we got yesterday or the day before yesterday we got the new meta space glasses and it's quite an interesting technology because it sort of uh, allows you to see the real world as it is through a see-through see uh, mirrors. And it projects the augmented images kind of on a, on a uh, half mirrors in front of your eyes. So you see the real world and you see the augmentation at the same time. But the real world is real. It's not a camera feed through, it's actually see-through. So you have, you know, really good resolution and color renditions and all, all the uh, good things which come from looking at the real world. Um, so if you are interested, we can, um, after the class, we can go to, to our office and those of you who are interested, you can try it on. Um, so we have some demo app where you can do some things and the hand tracking is not perfect and the, the glasses are not perfect neither, but it sort of gives you a bit of a, um, view of what is happening in, in that space. So that's from me. Um, so we have Christine today talking about um, technologies and, and topics in augmented reality. So we'll learn a little bit more. Yeah, talking too, too much.
Um, yeah, if you unplug the the external screen and plug it again, that may help. Yeah. Mobile phones are ubiquitous, the most convenient platform to do augmented reality. Augmented reality can also benefit from mobile phone sensors as accelerometers and magnetometers, which can improve the quality of augmented reality and facilitate user tracking. Uh, it produces a direct or indirect vision of a physical environment from the real world. These elements are combined with the virtual elements at real time. A virtual reality must have three conditions for it to be a virtual reality. Simulation refer to the ability of being a system allowed in the representation of a reality. Interaction to control the system or world represented. And perception, allowing buying to the senses through external elements. Mixed reality is the place between augmented reality and augmented virtuality. Um, where augmented reality combines real and virtual objects in a real environment and Augmented virtuality replaces the surrounding en environment by a virtual one. Mixed reality allows physical objects from the immediate environment of the user to be elements to interact with the virtual environment. Uh, mixed reality could be an application for giving a virtual scene for broadcasting the weather forecast with a real human over it. So, as we see, the weather we have on. In, on the TV today. There are three ways to visually present an augmented reality. Uh, the video see-through is where the virtual environment is replaced by a video feed of, re of reality and the augmented reality is overlaid upon the digitized images. Optical see-through leaves the real world perception alone but displays only the augmented reality overlay by means of transparent mirrors and lenses. Or to project the augmented reality overlay onto real objects themselves resulting in projective displays. Now I will talk about the paper. One of the papers I read is about location-based augmented reality on mobile phones from 2005. Um, these uh, guys uh, wanted to make an application for the mobile, uh, an augmented reality app for, um, for places like the museum where you know what elements you want to use the virtual reality on. Um, there are different technologies for the app to recognize the image from the phone's camera. When you take the phone off and you see through the camera, and then the app wants to recognize what you're seeing. Um, phone can place out special markers that the um, virtual reality system recognizes like some dots on the wall or something. Um, or you could build an algorithm that matches the image from the phone with images on the database of augmented reality-friendly museum artifacts. The database contains images taken by a special camera and stored with additional data like the camera position. So they have gone through the museum and taken pictures with a camera uh, of all the things that you should get information uh, with the app and uh, they store the important information about the picture in a database. Um, Post computation is the algorithm selects the database image which is the most similar to the live cell phone image. Matches the two images to find point correspondences based on features in both images. 
when the pose between the two images can be computed so that position and orientation of the phone camera can be known. So they use an algorithm where they look at points in both images from the database and the one on your phone and then they see if it matches and when they find an image that match they get the calculate the phone orientation. Uh, and uh, they used this, so therefore they didn't need any additional content in the environment in the museum. They didn't, they didn't have to place out something for the AR, <coughs> AR app to uh, work. There are multiple ways of getting the position of the phone camera. The accelerometer is one, but it proved to be noisy. The GPS is another, and they used this. If, if there was no GPS signal inside, they computed the position from the previous calculated position. So they wanted to know where you were in the building. Um, and the results, um, when they looked at the result on a 645 or 80, uh, image. They um, um, found out that the rotation was close to um, zero degrees and the error was only about two pixels. So they got a very um, accurate, um, yeah, very accurate. <laughs> and the bigger the image, the more features expected. But uh, then the algorithm they created were very slower. So, um, and the position error was about ten to fifteen centimeters. But here you see a map of the museum, and um, this is a set of green points around the truth, and the red points are computed positions. So you notice that they are quite near each other, except one green point. In the here, that's quite low, and um, this was because uh, the image quality was inadequate. Um, they chose to do the computation on the mobile instead of remote, even though they claim that many phones do not support floating point numbers making matching some computation quite making some computation quite slow. Remote data often does the computation and sends the result back to the phone, but this might cause trouble with bandwidth limitation and overhead. They claim that it will most likely be feasible to develop real-time augmented reality applications processed locally in the near future. Uh, this was in 2010. Has the mobile phones gotten any better at this? <laughs> So what, what were the main challenges for them to do the um, the registration of where the phone is looking at? Uh, it was the algorithm they created mm -hmm. um, didn't understand all the mathematics and stuff, but the, um, it was that they had a really big database mm -hmm. and they had to uh, try to come up with a search method in the database that didn't use a lot of time. Mm -hmm. They have to look at the position of the camera and just search in those pictures that was in that position. Yeah. Was the search done on the phone or was... Yeah. yeah. Did all the computation on the phone. Mm -hmm. Even though they meant that it was slow. Yeah. And what phone they used? It was 2010, yeah. so... Yeah? It's, wasn't it a Nokia or something? Yeah. It's, uh, it's a Nokia N97. Um, with... Uh, you have to use Symbian and C++ on those devices. Uh, they didn't have a gyroscope, they only had the accelerometer. Um, so yeah, the, one of the problems with accelerometer is that it's a bit noisy, so it doesn't give you a kind of a, a very stable static reading of the rotation of the phone. So you have to do a little bit of post-processing to um, to come up with the uh, reasonably stable kind of orientation matrix. Um, and you do have to 
uh, adjust for the errors. So do you have a slide with the errors they were reporting? Like you were saying 10 centimeters? So. Yeah, so the position error was reported 15 centimeters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, those are very good results. Um, it is a little bit surprising that they tried to use a GPS indoor because, yeah, yeah. it's not... Um, but they did like an algorithm there too because they knew that indoor they couldn't get any GPS, GPS signal. Mm -hmm. So they uh, thought about that the user wouldn't... Uh, move more than two meters or something from the last position to the next mm -hmm. and then they computed where he had been and where he could be now so mm -hmm. yeah they did some algorithms there too yeah so what are the what are the algorithms they mentioned in the paper for tracking indoor do you remember so they've they've mentioned um you could use a radio uh, based navigation so you have some sort of a uh, radio coverage and then you measuring the signal strength on the device and it's often used in robotics and there are some projects to do that on um, on mobile phones as well one of my friends he's doing a phd at otago and he's doing a project where you try to use uh, wi-fi access points to orientate where exactly you are in the room if you have multiple um, access points and you can measure the signal strength to the access points so you can kind of calculate of where you are in the room based on that. Um, but they were saying, yeah, those are reasonably good, but quite expensive to set up and quite expensive to maintain. Uh, and they wanted something a little bit more streamlined. Yeah, because it was like the same. So. Yeah. yeah. So they were trying to focus on a low cost solution. Uh, and the uh, results seem pretty good. Um, so in terms of augmented reality, what is um, what is the common thing which people use instead of uh, taking photographs of the room? They use markers, right? Yeah. So instead of um, photographing the real environment, uh, you can put markers and the marker pr provides you kind of a very detailed information about the orientation and the um, position of the person taking the uh, looking at that particular marker um, but it has some drawbacks so you would have to put those markers everywhere in the museum and then yeah the, the tracking would be a little bit more ef efficient and effective because of that um, so yeah, overall, what, what do you think about the paper? Have you guys read the paper as well? So what do you think? What's still relevant? It was 2010. Is that all, all algorithms and things still relevant today? <coughs> all the calculations possibly. Yeah. Okay. Yep, so the processing speed has improved. You can do more today than uh, you could before. So most of the algorithms and some of the uh, things they've used are correct. What would you use for the phone orientation today instead of uh, accelerometer? Yeah, we would use gyroscope, um, which provides more reliable and more stable readings of the phone orientation. Um, So what, what happens if you're a little bit off? What happens if you... Um, do you have the, the article? No. Yeah, they, they had some diagrams of some photographs showing uh, exactly how the augmentation works uh, with and w without some adjustments and, what, uh, and how it kind of uh, looks like. So, in any case, what, what do you know? Like, if you are using an augmented reality app, 
and it doesn't work perfectly, what are the side effects? What what's what do you see? What are the typical problems? If you like get wrong information. Yeah, so the information is the wrong place. Yeah. Um so you know you want something to overlay something else but it's sort of a little bit off. Uh sometimes it jitters, so it sort of uh, jumps around. So you want the character to be like, you know, on your hand, but it kind of uh, goes around a little bit. It's not fixed to the position. It sort of um, uh, goes out of place. Um, sometimes the augmentation disappears because the tracking is lost and then you don't know where to place the, uh, the virtual annotations or virtual objects. Um, Another problem is the delay. So sometimes you swing the camera and the, both the feed and the augmentation sort of happens with the delay. Uh, that's one of the problems which they do have with things like Oculus because you want to have the video feed and augmentation happening so fast that when you move your head, it sort of happens instantaneously. Otherwise you get a bit of a motion sickness because it's sort of uh, the world doesn't react exactly to your movement and that disorients your brain. Um, yeah, so yeah, what else you kind of learned from the paper? Apart from the math being kind of uh, yeah, a bit heavy in places. There's quite a lot of work um, in computer vision to help with the feature tracking and feature extraction and augmented reality uses certain classes of algorithms which are fast. So you want the features because you know you get the image but you are recording the previous uh, snaps and extracting some of the features from the snaps so when you're comparing them you can do the comparisons very fast. Um, so did they mention any particular algorithms that they've used? Yeah. Yeah, they they do mention uh surf, which is one of the uh better ones, but it's a bit slower. Um so there is um Yeah. There are some other algorithms which are a little bit less reliable but much faster. And all you need is, is speed. Uh, reliability, of course, is, is important, but if you're too slow, then the effect is kind of lost. Um, some of the algorithms are built in into uh, OpenCV, but most of the time you do have to um, optimize manually for a particular architecture that you're working with uh, and do some processing on the GPU. Yeah, I think the it's quite a technical paper. It sort of describes um, they haven't really done like you know experiments. They they designed some of the um, aspects for the application and inv investigated what are the limitations and what are the errors and so on. So that's sort of like a technical report for the technology that they were developing. So it's somewhat different to the previous study, which was actually using participants and conducting experiments and analyzing the raw data. Um, okay. Any questions about the article? Did you like the article? Was it easy to follow? Cool. So who read the article? Okay. Yeah. Six others here, but no mark. Yeah. Okay. So we kind of close that one.